Now, we have been in a series called Unexpected Stories because some of the greatest stories in the world are those that have unexpected things happen. And uh, we first talked about God's epic story, which is, you know, how God, from the beginning of time when he made us, he was uh, pursuing us in love, that he was a God who was a creator and a pursuer. His desire is to walk with us and to have relationship with us to, um, and to heal our brokenness. And uh, that is this epic story of what the Bible is all about. But then last week, we kind of looked at a little picture of that. And this, just for me, it's one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament of this of King Hezekiah, Hezekiah leading the world's worst Passover service ever. Laws were broken. People had no idea what they were doing. They messed up constantly. But they were seeking God. They were seeking to reconcile with each other. And it says, after all of this mess up, God healed them. Because he is a God who wants us to love him and to respond to his love. It's always about relationship. And so that's what we've been looking at. But today kind of leads us to another unexpected story that's going to be in the New Testament. But before we jump in, I, I kind of wanted to share a little bit of, of my story so that you can kind of see Every time I share with you, do know, I am coming up here and I just say thank you and welcome to listening to the message that was for me. And so this, that, that way again today, where I, I feel like every time I get a chance to speak or preach, God is working on me in this area so much, and you just get to be a part of that. So congratulations and welcome to my message for me. <laughs> so my, my story, Raylan and I, we, we come from, you know, home is Florida, we come from a city named Lakeland in central Florida, and that's kind of where home has, has been for most of our lives. Then uh, about four years, four, uh, sorry, wow, about four years ago, I accepted a discipleship pastor position in Rice Lake, Wisconsin, which is a little bit different climate than Lakeland, Florida. Now, when we decided to move to Wisconsin, especially Rice Lake, which I didn't even know exi- I didn't know that city even existed, when we decided to move, you can imagine how many raised eyebrows, you know, our family members, our friends were giving us. But do you remember the year of the polar vortex? <laughs> yeah, I want to point out that was four years ago. <laughs> because that was the year that we went to Rice Lake. Now, I promise you, I'm not, I am not lying. I, this is not a preacher story. This is true. That was supposed to be funny. Sadly, most people are like, oh, okay, this one's a good one. Um, That, uh, I had never seen zero temperature. I mean, we went to, we went to a theme park kind of thing at near Universal Studios that was called Ice. That was nine degrees. That was the coldest I'd ever seen in my life. Okay. And they gave us jackets, you know, I mean, and it was awesome. And so this was not anything I expected. If you would have said, Don, what do you think is the absolute coldest temperature it could get outside of the Antarctica? I would have said, negative five. I had no idea. I mean, I was from Florida. I had seen snow like twice in my life. And it was like a half inch. And we were like, what? It was amazing. So we come here. And I promise you that there was one morning during that polar vortex of hell that we were, I was driving to church, to, to the office one morning. I passed a bank sign, and it said negative 34 degrees. I would have wet my pants, but it would have froze. It was so, I had never experienced anything like this in my life. Now, I put a picture on Facebook I wanted to show you this morning. This is truly, I promise, this is an iceberg hanging off of our church building in the midst of that polar vortex. These are my two girls. I put this on, and I was having people from Florida going, they weren't even impressed with the iceberg. They were looking at the temperature going, it's negative 13, and your girls don't even have their jackets zipped. I was like, hey, that's how we in Wisconsin do it, you know. <laughs> so it was, this was a crazy adventure in our life. And I know you're saying, why are you sharing the story? And I'm, I don't really know, but I have a point. I do. It was an adventure. Unfortunately, we moved to Rice Lake from Florida after six months of being in this amazing church, amazing staff. We loved this place. But six months in, we realized, the pastor and I realized, that what they needed was not a discipleship pastor. It was an administrative pastor. 
That is not what I am. In fact, I was doing all of this administrative stuff, and it was kind of sucking the life out of my soul. It really was. It's just not who I was made. It's, it's not the job I would have picked. And so as we were going on, as great as this church was, and as wonderful as things were going on, I wasn't a good fit for the position that they needed. And so what happened is that, you know, after we, we took several months, and so basically after a year of being in the church, we decided that it was we needed to move. We needed to stop being at the church. And so what we did is we had a house still in Florida, and so we moved back to Florida, which I got to tell you was so hard because we loved that pastor and staff. They were like brothers and sisters. But even more, our small group at that church, even today, is some of our closest friends that we've ever had. And so it was so hard to leave, but you know, we had a house in Florida. We didn't have a job in Wisconsin. And so we moved back. That was, that was the time that we knew I needed to go ahead and, and pursue a PhD, which we had been talking about for a long time. And, and me leaving Wisconsin was kind of like, okay, we'll never have a time like right now. I don't have a job. <laughs> and we have time. My wife had a great job. Let's, let's go ahead and do this. And so we, we, I began the PhD, and I started looking for part-time work. So we've lived in Florida about three months when I get a call from a church saying, we want a part-time pastor. I'm like, I, I can be a part-time pastor. And, he, and where are you? And he's in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. <laughs> and so Florida, Wisconsin, Florida for three months. We visited. We felt like God was in it. And so we moved our family to Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. And so basically within two years, we moved from Florida to Wisconsin, northern Wisconsin, to Florida, to southern Wisconsin. And then six months into that new church, it became obvious that there was a lot of damage done. The church wasn't healthy. It was uh, not financially sustainable, and it wasn't going to become that way. So bottom line is I moved my church to Sun Prairie so that we could help close a church very well. We had a small group with the people who were there, and we helped them heal over the next year. We helped them plug into other churches. And it was, it was a beautiful thing. And we knew God was in this the whole time. And it was a lot of change. But we couldn't help but ask, Lord, what about us? I still had this in my memory. You know, you're like, what about us? God obviously loves so many people. But, but had he forgotten us? Now, let me back up. Because a constant prayer in my life for many years has always been, Lord, I wanna, will you make me more like Jesus? Will you conform me to the image of your son? God, whatever it takes, and I prayed this so many times, I want my family to learn to trust you with everything. See, and I have no doubt that our weird, unreproducible story over the last couple of years is part of God answering that prayer. We learn to trust God when he is all we have to rely on. And I can say for the last four years, there has been very little stability. There's been no jobs that you go, this is finally, I have, you know, this is my stability. It has been a journey of relying on God. And I have to tell you, my wife and my kids can tell you too, and God providing over and over and over where you just go, I, sorry, wrong side. <laughs> I couldn't have imagined. You guys are getting to, I'll tell you what, I'm so, you're, you're getting to see somebody who is goofy and clumsy. And uh, at some point, while I'm here this summer, I will trip, okay? <laughs> I want to tell you right now when it happens, laugh, get it out of your system, but don't feel bad for me. My wife will tell you, I do it all the time. I have already hit every corner of every wall in this church with my shoulder. It's okay. I'm not blind. I'm just an idiot. So just know that that's the way it's going to be. Um, all of that. And we're learning to trust God, you know? <laughs> Sorry. Now, in the process of all of that I shared with you, it really does have a point. I'm seeing a weakness in myself. And this is where we're going. Because like a lot of you, I continually judge who I am and my value based on what I do. That my value is based upon my performance. If I'm doing well, if I'm performing, 
then I'm, I have value, I have some pride, I'm, I'm feeling good. But if I'm not performing, or if things aren't going well around me, or worse, if people aren't happy with what I'm doing or what I'm involved in, then I feel like I don't measure up. <laughs> I feel like I'm, I'm, I don't have any value. See, to my core, I feel like I have to earn love. It's been, that's always been my MO. I have to earn love. Does uh, anybody else struggle with that? Do you have to earn it? But see, value based on performance is a lie. It's a lie. It's a tough lie to overcome, but it's a lie. Especially when everybody else around us looks like they have their stuff all together, you know? I mean, check out Facebook. Everybody looks so good. They've lost 30 pounds in two weeks. They're, the family pictures are beautiful. They eat healthy. I mean, on Facebook, people even make it seem like kale can taste good. <laughs> it's true. People are sharing how, how God is blessing their lives and their families and their children. And oh yeah, and their children just won all the championships and their, their kids don't disobey and they're always respectful. And, and you're looking at all this going, um, that has, this, my life doesn't look anything like this. And what I'm learning is that people, they post the best of their life on Facebook, but then I compare that to the worst of my life. And, and, and it doesn't work. I never, I can never measure up when I'm comparing the wor my worst to their best. I can't measure up when I'm comparing my best to their best because their best is in areas that I'm terrible at. And I bet they are looking at me at some of my best and they're going, man, I'm just terrible because they can't measure up to my best because they're terrible at it. And so it's this cycle. So do you ever feel like you're expected to have it all together, but you know you don't? So you fake it, or you don't let people in and get to know the real you. You're scared somebody's going to figure out that you've been faking it all along. So you make it look like you have it all together. I'm sure it's not just me. There, there was a study that they got a lot of, <coughs> excuse me, they got a lot of professionals together. And um, they, they looked at like pastors and doctors and psychologists, and nutritionists, and they, they asked each of these groups of people what what would it take daily to be healthy in your area? And when you added up all the time that you needed to exercise and sleep and spend time with your family and time at your job, uh, time praying and reading your Bible, it ended up to be like 40 hours a day. 40 hours a day to be healthy. I'm like, no wonder my life's a mess. I'm 16 hours behind every single day. <laughs> no wonder I can't measure up because the game is rigged. The game's rigged. And I feel guilty like a failure, but I can't measure up to 40 hours when I only have 24. So you wonder, is this what God intended? If we don't measure up, and we're not, are we failing? When we don't measure up, is God mad at us? That's what today's story is about. If you have a Bible, we're going to spend most of the day in Luke 7. <coughs> and at this point in the story... Jesus is becoming really popular. He's been healing the sick. He's been raising the dead. He's been ticking off the Pharisees like crazy, you know, because he's teaching with authority that nobody expected. And then it says in um, Luke 7, 36, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and he reclined at the table. Now, at this part, Jesus is becoming quite the public figure. He walks into town. Everybody knows who he is. People are wanting to, you know, their, their kids healed or they're dealing with something. And so they're, he's quite the figure. And he agrees to dinner. And I'm sure that created quite an emotion throughout the city because these cities are tiny. I mean, you know, a couple hundred people are, are hearing about this. And so I, I wanted to show you how a typical home back then was set up. You, you have this courtyard that is surrounded by other rooms, and that's kind of how it was back then. A family would build their home around an open courtyard. This is where the meals were eaten. And as families grew and, you know, people got married, they would build on to this outer house around the courtyard, and they just keep adding bedrooms. And that's where, you know, the next kid and their wife would live, and then and their kids. And then when somebody got married, and they just keep building around a courtyard. And so if you had an opportunity to host somebody important, what you would do is you'd, you'd meet in the courtyard around a table. Usually it would be really low and everybody would recline 
you know, really low, laying on pillows. But they would open up the door and allow the community to come in and kind of line the perimeter of the room. Because, I mean, if you had a celebrity, that didn't happen all the time in these areas. And so all of the community who was interested, they would stand around and kind of participate or at least listen to the conversation going on around the table. And that's kind of what was happening in this story. Jesus and his disciples and the Pharisee were reclining on cushions around a low table. I would guess that the Pharisee was pretty stoked that he was having somebody as noted and as famous as Jesus coming to, ha- to his house for dinner. But then, I mean, so quick, the unexpected happens in this story. Look at the next slide. It says, a woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind Jesus at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. (coughs) Now, this seems weird to us, but we can't even understand how ridiculously awkward this was for them. Because see, they're sitting here eating and talking. A sinful woman approaches Jesus, which... A woman approaching a man in a first century Middle Eastern culture or even today in the Middle East is so countercultural and so uncomfortable. When this starts happening, you can just imagine everybody's like, what, are we, what do you even do when somebody goes outside of the culture so much? Women didn't, not only, I mean, women didn't approach men and they surely didn't touch men who were outside their family, especially a rabbi or a respected teacher But this woman, she comes, she approaches Jesus, and she's crying at his feet. Then she unbinds her hair in public. Absolutely repulsive act in the Middle East, especially in that culture. And you wonder, what kind of woman is this? Because she takes her hair, and she begins wiping Jesus' feet with her hair. And see, the fact, (coughs) excuse me, the fact that she had an alabaster jar, which was a very expensive perfume, gives a good indication that she might have been a prostitute because prostitutes used alabaster or expensive perfumes to make themselves smell attractive. Sadly, um, prostitution in this day was very common. You you figure um, men often died at a young age and if their wives did not have children who were grown, they had no way to support themselves in that culture and there was no life insurance. She couldn't own land. She couldn't get a job. So often, for a woman, a a widow, selling herself was the only way to provide for her young children. And so it's really sad and and very common. And you can just imagine how in that moment, you know, how scared and uncomfortable she was as she was approaching Jesus' feet. Everybody in the room was judging her. And she knew it. And she didn't feel, you know, welcome in that place. She was just expected to be quiet and stay on the perimeter with all of the other people, but she couldn't. She was overwhelmed, and she began crying at Jesus' feet. She never says a word in the story. She just sobs and wipes Jesus' feet with her hair and pours her expensive perfume all over his feet. To most of the people in the room, it was was uncomfortable. It was appalling. The story continues in verse 39. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, this spectacle, you know, He said to himself, if this man, if he were really a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is, that that, that she's a sinner. I mean, of course this was the Pharisee's response. This woman, she was dirty. She was sinful. The Pharisee knew it. The crowd knew it. Even she knew it. If Jesus was a real prophet, he would have known how disgraceful this whole scene was. But you know, like we have seen every week, Jesus looks at her differently than everybody else. He looks at her differently than she looks at herself. And Jesus once again begins to redefine the law about who is pure and who is not, about who can be touched, about who is on the inside, who is on the outside. And Jesus answers the Pharisee. He says, Simon... I have something to tell you. Now, you gotta, I love this because the last verse, uh, if, if we go back, it says, the Pharisee saw this, he said to himself, and then Jesus answers him. I, 
don't you love that? You're like, is this one of those moments where the Pharisee's like, did I say that out loud? <laughs> I love that. But Jesus knew what he was thinking. He answers him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Well, tell me, teacher, he said. Verse 41. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay, back, pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of these men loved him more? Now, let me, 50 denarii, <coughs> excuse me, is about a month's wages. 500 is about two years' worth. Instead of demanding payment, the lender forgives them both. Which one is more appreciative? So, if I owe $8,000 on my credit card, and I get a letter in the mail that says it's forgiven, that's a good day. That is a good day. But, if I owe $80,000, and I get a letter that says it's forgiven, that's a game changer. That changes my life. The Pharisee recognized that. So he says, I suppose the one who had bigger debt forgiven. Jesus, you judge correctly. <laughs> I, lo- I love it. Just so relaxed. You judge correctly. I-, I have a feeling Simon didn't like where this was going because it's verse 44. Then Jesus turned toward the woman. So he's looking at the woman, but he's speaking to Simon. And he says, <clears throat> do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet. Remember, no asphalt, dirty roads, dust everywhere. A typically, it wasn't required, but typically if a guest was at your house, especially a, notori- you know, a guest of notoriety, you'd wash their feet because they're dirty. You didn't wash my feet. Yet, she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. He says, you didn't give me a kiss, which is the typical, even today, the typical Middle Eastern greeting. You didn't give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume, her perfume on my feet. Verse 47, therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love is shown. Not mentioning names here, Simon, but whoever has been forgiven little loves little. See, the Pharisees, they knew the law. They knew it up and down. They focused so much on believing correctly and behaving correctly, but they they continually missed the point. Relationship with God and with other people. They desired desperately their own personal purity so that they were right. They worked so hard to earn God's love. Ooh, does that sound familiar? They were trying to please God in their own strength. They felt like their value was based on what they do and believe. All of a sudden, I'm like, "Uh uh-oh. This might be talking to me. They looked down on everybody. The woman, she was a wreck. She had heard all of her life that she was too messed up to earn earn God's love. She couldn't. You are so messed up, you could never earn God's love. But then here comes Jesus who says she doesn't have to. She was loved. Why? Just because. Because God chose to love her. God chooses to love people. But then Jesus blows everybody away. Look at the the scripture. He says to her, your sins are forgiven. And the other guests begin to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. (coughs) Now, every Jew knew that only God can forgive sins. So who is Jesus think, who, you know, claiming this level of authority? Now, you've kind of gotten to know me. Those of you who have been here for a couple of weeks, I love audience participation. And so I am going to ask you for some answers because you have Jesus. He lets this woman wash his feet with her hair. He lectures Simon the Pharisee and announces the woman's sins are forgiven. In that moment, what do you think the Pharisee might have been thinking? Yeah, who who does Jesus think he is? Anybody? (laughs) Why did I invite this guy? That is a great answer. Um, What is he feeling about Jesus right now? Get him out. Anger, blasphemy. I mean, you can just, oh, this guy deserves to die. Okay. What do you think the people around the room are thinking? They're not all Pharisees. They're normal people. What are they thinking? 
<laughs> Maybe, yeah. What is the Pharisee going to do? I mean, where are the stones? Good. So, yeah, the Pharisee, they're, they're actually looking, going, ooh, this is awkward. I mean, you got the Pharisee. What's he going to do? He has a safe face. You've got Jesus over here. I mean, he, he keeps healing people. He keeps raising people from the dead. I mean, maybe he does have the authority to forgive sins. And there's this struggle back and forth. Absolutely. But now, here's the, here's the real question. In that moment, what did the woman, what was she feeling and thinking? Wow. What? My sins are forgiven? She's been told all her life, you're not worthy. You can't earn God's love. And all of a sudden she says, I have it. I'm forgiven. I'm loved. I'm not condemned. I mean, amazing. In that moment, her theology wasn't important. She was experiencing something she had never experienced in her life. Love. I mean, Jesus had rocked everybody's theology in the room. But more importantly for her, he changed her life. She felt loved. See, no matter what any of us have done, no matter what any of us have become, as far as we have strayed, God invites us to come to him just like we are. You know, what I love about the story is Jesus didn't say to the prostitute, hey, go clean yourself up and then come back. She came just as she was. You know, we don't, we don't need to clean ourselves up to come to Jesus. We, we don't need to figure out the right words because socially she did everything wrong. She messed up so much. We don't need to put on a mask and act like we have it all together, that our life is perfect. We get to come just as we are. God pursues, we respond. Then he transforms us. Then he cleans us up and begins the long, lifelong process of making us whole. See, the Pharisee, he saw himself as a little sinner. And as a result, he loved little. He didn't recognize God's huge offer of grace in his own life. And therefore, he offered little grace to others. But the woman, she saw it so different. He didn't see a desperate need for God, but she sure did. Because she knew who she really was, and she was a mess. She needed forgiveness. There was nothing she could do. She, didn't, she was not capable of earning forgiveness. But here was Jesus offering it freely. See, for us, there is no hole too deep that God can't reach us and pull us out. We can't go too far. God is always inviting you back, always inviting you back. You messed up and you left. You, you denied everything you believed when you were growing up. And God is saying, I welcome you back. Come back. We sometimes feel like we need to clean ourselves up first, but we can't because we're not strong enough. Every time I try to clean up myself, it's amazing how it doesn't take very long before I'm dirty again. I just keep, I, I can't help messing up. But when we come to God and we allow him to transform our lives, it is a long, slow journey, but it is a journey to help us become more and more like Jesus, more and more conformed to the image of Christ. He is the one who transforms us. And as we grow, all we can do is, as we grow and as we transform, all we can do is praise him and say, thank you for what you have done. It's not about me. Thank you for changing me. We don't have to fake it. We're, we're broken and it's okay. We're broken. It's not okay. It's just our lot. This is who we are. We are broken. All of us. And God says, I know. I've got a plan for that. It's called sending my son. He's going to die for all of us. But he's not going to stay dead. He's going to rise from the dead. And by the way, that's going to change everything. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the power that transforms us, that lives inside of us. So in this story from Luke, who's the bad guy? It's the Pharisee, right? Nobody likes the Pharisee. Why? Because he's judgmental, he's arrogant, he acts like it, he has it all together. And the reality is he's just a jerk. <laughs> he's more sinful than the prostitute. Look at this saying. God isn't turned off by our mess. He's turned off by our pride. That was what was happening with the Pharisee. He was as much of a mess as, as the woman. But this, the response was totally different by Jesus because Jesus was attracted to the one who recognized her mess 
And he kind of said some harsh words to the one who was prideful. God isn't turned off by our mess. He's turned off by our pride. Now, as we close, I want to share a prayer with you because there's this song in the Old Testament that King David wrote when he was confronted about a heart-wrenching sin. Now, like the woman in today's story, he was absolutely broken and repentant. He didn't deny his sin. He didn't cover it up. He didn't put a mask on. He didn't make excuses. He just confessed it. That song we know as Psalm 51. But there are two lines in that psalm or that song that are so good for today's message. And I wanted to read these. It says, this is David praying to God. You do not desire a sacrifice. Back then they sacrificed animals. It was part of the, it was, you know, part of the law. You do not desire a sacrifice. If you did, I'd offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice that you desire God is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. See, God desires honesty and authenticity. God wants us to recognize how badly we need him. He is the one who gives us value. He is the one who loves us. He is the one who can restore us. And whether you're, you're just beginning this journey with God, trying to figure him out, or whether you've been a follower of Jesus for your whole life, Every day, God is inviting you to know him, to follow him, to be loved by him, to respond in love. No matter who you are, where you, where you are in life, what you've become, he's inviting you. Know him, follow him, be loved by him, and return that love to him. So let's do some public confession. Everybody's like, I think it's time for lunch. <laughs> Raise your hand if your life's messy. And you don't have it all together. Good. Look around. Then I feel good. Welcome to humanity. We are a mess. I believe that honesty and, and, um, and being authenticity, I think those are really attractive to people. Fake is not. Nobody likes the Pharisee because he's fake, because he pretends that he has it all together. He probably even thinks he has it all together. But he, he's, he's a mess. He just doesn't let anybody see it. Not attractive. But... Today's story resonates with so many people because whether Christian or not, we love watching somebody who is just like, that, like the sinful woman who is authentic and honest and broken and just is, lets you see the real her. And when, we, when, when she does that, what do we get to see? We get to see God doing something incredibly powerful, offering mercy and acceptance and love. That is so attractive. That is good news. When Christians are holier than thou, when we act like we have our everything together and we honestly that we can do it on our own, we don't even need God, people are robbed of seeing what God can do in somebody's life. So we need to be real. We need to begin trusting relationships with each other where we can be honest, where we can say I'm a mess and I need help and allow other people to be Jesus' hands and feet in our life and then give us opportunities to be his hands and feet, his tangible presence in the lives of others. We, we need to love people, not, not judge them. Our job is to point people towards the one who is able to clean up the mess. It's not my job to clean up your mess. Frankly, it's not my job to clean up my mess. It's my job to keep looking at Jesus and say, God, clean up this mess. And he does. So no matter what you've done or who you've become, he invites you. And he invites me to, to come to him and allow him to begin restoring us. He knows you're not perfect. That's why Jesus came. God's done everything necessary to make you right with him. And, and this is such a struggle for me, but God doesn't love me more when I behave. He doesn't love me more when I do, when I perform. He doesn't. My acceptance is not based on my performance and neither is yours. It's not. Nothing you do makes you acceptable to God. It's Jesus' death and resurrection that does that. So really the question for today is, who are you in the story? Who are you? Are you the Pharisee? Maybe you've been acting in your life. You look back and you go, man, I've been acting like I don't need God. Maybe you've been in a place of influence. You've just forgotten your role is to point people towards God. Or maybe you've just been... Ignoring the fact you, you kind of know you're broken, but you've been trying to fix it on your own for so long. And you know you keep failing because we all do. 
Maybe you're like the crowd. You're on the sidelines waiting to see what happens, kind of afraid to embarrass yourself or to overcommit. You're wondering what's going to happen here. Maybe you're enjoying the process of watching other people. But Jesus is also inviting you into the story. He's saying, follow me, because it's a great journey. It's a journey of self-discovery, of self-restoration, I mean, of restoration, of becoming day by day more and more like Jesus. It's beautiful. But the real paradox is that the point of the story is to become like the sinful woman. The prostitute's the hero. She was broken before God. It didn't matter what everybody else thought. She needed Jesus, and she chose him over everything in her life. And as a result, Jesus changed everything in her life. She was forgiven and new. That is what God wants to offer us. Freedom. Newness. Life. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. God lives in us when we choose to follow Jesus and changes us and transforms us. And Paul in the Bible calls gives us resurrection life. We become brand new. So I don't know where you are in your, in your story. Some in this room, maybe you've just been checking out this God thing and you're not sure, you've got a lot of doubts. Jesus is saying, follow me. I want to change everything. And some of us in here, we've been followers of Jesus for our whole lives. We don't even remember. It's been so long. And Jesus is saying to us, stop trying to do it on your own. Stop living for, for, you know, trying to perform to earn my love. I love you. Follow me. Follow me. See, no matter where we are, the invitation's always the same. Follow Jesus. And so I want to invite you to do that today. So would you just bow your heads? You don't have to, I'm going to lead us in a prayer. You don't have to say it out loud, just to yourself. But if you want to just take a step to follow Jesus today, in in your heart of hearts, would you say something like, like this, Jesus, thank you for showing love and patience to that sinful woman and to this sinful person. Help me to follow you. Help me to recognize your acceptance and love for me. Help me to stop earning your love and trying to perform. But today, I follow you. I admit my brokenness before you. I'm yours. In your name I pray. Amen.